At 5am on the 15th of August 2013, sports statistician Martin Manley entered the south end of the Overland Park Police Station parking lot. After walking beneath a tree, Martin pulled out his phone and dialed 911. When the operator answered, Martin told them, I want to report a suicide at the south end of the parking lot of the Overland Park Police Station at 123rd and Metcalf. Putting down the phone, he pulled out his pistol and shot himself in the head. With him, police would find a detailed letter that read as the following. I committed suicide of my own free will. I am not under the influence of any drugs. I am sorry for your inconvenience. You will be contacted within a matter of hours by my sister. She will find out about this by an overnight letter and or email I sent to her which she will get this morning. In it, I explained the exact location where I shot myself and gave her your phone number. At that time, she will tell you who I am. If you discover who I am prior to her call, please do not contact her. I do not want her or anyone else I sent letters to overnight to find out about it from you. I want them to find out about it from me. Thank you. The overnight letters and emails intended to reach Martin's loved ones hours after he committed this act not only contained his final personal words, but also covered all the practical things you do not want to think about after losing a loved one. Martin included GPS coordinates to his car, how to enter his home, information on his pre-arranged organ donation, details for the cremation he had already paid for and requests for his gun, ammunition and phone to be destroyed. Martin's suicide, much like himself, was extremely organised and included an entire blog detailing his entire life and thought process leading up to his final moments. It's in fact so detailed, in his own words, he tells us what he was probably thinking about at the very end. If you were trying to imagine what it was like in the closing minutes, standing there next to a tree in the dark at the corner of a parking lot all by myself with a gun and a bullet, you were worrying too much about what must have been going through my head, no pun intended. I guarantee you from having imagined my way through it a hundred times, the only thing going through my head was asking for forgiveness, remembering those whom I love, being glad I was able to end it the way I wanted, and thrilled to death that I left this website. Don't weep for me dying alone, we all die alone. The act of suicide can be horrible for those left behind, I couldn't control the fact of the matter, but I could control the circumstances. I believe the way I did it coupled with overnight letters, emails, and this website, is the best I can do to mitigate the hurt. And besides, as I said in other categories on this site, if I was seriously needed by anyone, or if I had parents or children, I would have never considered it. As it turns out, my daily freedom from responsibilities gave me the ultimate freedom. Today we are going to be looking into martinmanlylifeanddeath.com to try and better understand why he decided to stamp his own use by date. For the sake of the length of the video, I won't go into all these pages, but focus on the lead up to the suicide and his thoughts and rationale. Regardless of his motives, which we'll get into, I do want to say it's not my intention to romanticize suicide, whether through his blog or this video. If you do feel in any way like this is something you are considering, please seek help. Five hundred and ninety-two days before Martin's eventual suicide, in what looks to be his first post to his blog, Martin writes an interview-style post where he uses his two internet handles as alter egos. The first, Len Tinman, the emotional side, and who he describes as the handle he used to have long-standing relationships, and Al Mali, the rational and logical side, who Martin describes as the handle that would engage in more hit-and-run confrontational situations. Len Tinman plays the interviewer and Devil's Advocate as they discuss why Martin has decided to commit suicide. The interview begins with the question, Why have you decided now to explore this rather than in the past or waiting until sometime in the future? Al Mali responds, Mainly because I haven't had any prevailing reason to do it in the past. As to why not put it off longer, the reason is because the day may come sooner than I would hope when I simply won't be in control of my future. As the interview continues, Al speaks on his concern that at some point he'll go beyond his ability to produce a record of his history, the proof he existed. Len questions this and asks why a record of their history even matters. 
Al-Mali responds by saying he has no way of leaving a legacy as he does not have children, and there's no way of his memory being passed down. Len asks if Al plans to commit suicide simply because he does not have any children, to which Al replies. That's twisting what I said. First of all, I'm not saying I want to commit suicide, and certainly not today. But I am saying that I want to begin to consider it seriously. And the reason is because if I'm going to leave a record of my life, whether the world cares or not, I'm going to have to be proactive about it. That means I'm going to have to do it while I'm still somewhat lucid, somewhat intelligent. If I wait too long, not only will it be too late to produce it, but it may even be too late to commit the act. During their back and forth, it becomes clear Al, or Martin, believes his mind is slowly worsening with age, and that is what concerns him. The real fear stems not from life itself, but rather the depreciation of its quality over time, as he neared the end over the next 10 or 20 years. A big theme of this post is centred around the right, as Al puts it, to document his legacy and end his life of his own free will, while Len struggles with the concept. Al continues to speak on the decline of his mental abilities, saying, You are the glass half full, and I'm the glass half empty. You see what you want to see, I see what you refuse to see. You think just because we write these complicated, sophisticated articles every day on UFR that we are as sharp as ever, and as sharp as any other 58 year old. But I know what it takes, it takes having Google as part of our brain. It takes going over something 10 times that should have only taken once, and 10 years ago would have only taken once. Len responds saying, Well, so what? Everyone gets old, everyone loses their memory, everyone fades from the front pages of life. It's inescapable, and it's part of the cost of doing business as a human being. It seems to me the better way is to accept the fact and go out with dignity. Al responds, that's the whole point. Going out as a blabbering, slobbering old man in a wheelchair in a nursing home is hardly dignified. The post ends with Len agreeing on this point but urging Al to think on the matter for a few months. Al agrees to give it a few months but reiterates if there's indisputable evidence the two are in serious mental decline, he will approach the subject more aggressively with these final words being, I'm not going to just sit idly by and drift with the winds of time into obscurity. No matter what you think today, that's never going to happen. In the suicide preface, Martin writes, I sent personalized suicide letters and emails to many people I know. Letters that should have arrived in the morning of August 15th, 2013, just hours after I did the deed. I also sent boxes with personal mementos to quite a few people in the hope that they will remember me better. I plan to end my own life for as long as I remember. I didn't put a date on it, however, until June 11th, 2012, I never accepted the, what I would call, archaic notion that I should simply die at some point, either in a long drawn out miserable death or in an instant for which I was not prepared. That was an insane thought in my orderly world, and I knew the only way I could be confident about going out the way I wanted was to do it at a relatively early age. Martin also states in detail his life was rather comfortable, and he tells us he was not afflicted by loneliness, depression, health problems, loss or financial difficulty. He didn't lack humour either, stating he had a stash of gold and silver worth over $200,000 and posting coordinates in a picture. After his death, it's reported 20 or so people showed up at the location in the picture with shovels and metal detectors to find his stash, to which he had already given away. The rest of the preface is simply reiterating that this was his decision and he was not under any duress. A list of names, both from his physical and online world, are posted in his goodbyes and well wishes, accompanied by the song, Sing Off by Carol Burnett. Martin's website covers everything from his marriages, religion, gun control, the books he's written, and each piece of his life he deemed important enough to include in his biography. What's easy to see from the very beginning of the blog is Martin is a logic-based person. So when he discusses the logical and rational fears that come with the decline in quality of life associated with growing old, it is understandable to see why he could come to this conclusion. But I think there's more to it than that, and while I don't know him personally, and I'm not going to argue his decision, 
what I did find were a few insights to how he viewed the world. He tells us that his upbringing was somewhat solitary in the sense that he grew up in the sticks and had become satisfied with his own company. In part, he attributes the ability to enjoy his own company to the downfall of his marriages. When he speaks of the world, he has a rather bleak point of view, using Hurricane Sandy, the Sandy Hook Massacre, the Boston bombing, and the tornadoes that ravaged Oklahoma and El Reno as examples of the suffering occurring. Martin also admits he didn't travel outside of the United States because of how dangerous he believed it to be for Americans because of kidnapping and ransoms. When talking of the future, he predicts America's economic collapse and the inevitable horrors that await, stating, Unfortunately, it is likely to get worse, a lot worse. I honestly believe I would have seen a dirty bomb go off in a big city or a virus sweep the world or a nuke in the hands of terrorists. I honestly believe I might have seen a tsunami wipe out an American coast or a volcano destroy half of Mexico City or Seattle. These things are going to happen someday, but even if they didn't happen in my lifetime had I tried to live as long as I was able, one thing absolutely positively would happen, and there is nothing on this earth that can stop it. Throughout his blog, his justification for the website is largely leaving behind a legacy by being remembered for something, and that something is this comprehensive suicide note. In one part of his blog, he even mentions the hope that his site would be put into the Guinness Book of Records for the longest suicide note, and tells us, After you die, you can be remembered by a few line obituary for one day in a newspaper when you're too old to matter to anyone anyway. Or, you can be remembered for years by a site such as this. That was my choice, and I chose the obvious. Though Martin doesn't seem to regret not having children, as he tells us this was by choice, it seems when he looks forward to the future, there aren't connections with an equal exchange of emotional dependence that you may find with your children, partner, or loved ones. In his mind, the future holds a slow fade into black with nothing left behind to say you are on this earth. The initial interview between his two personas, Len Tinman and Al Mali, in my opinion, offers more insight into Martin after reading through a lot of his blog. The betrayal of a logical man who made a rational decision based on his own beliefs is not an illusion. The logical and confrontational Al Mali is responsible for the final decision to create the blog and commit the act. But the emotional side of Len Tinman was in the driver's seat. Len Tinman viewed the end as a lonely one and was less decisive about the decision, but when looking at the final chapter, saw an end without his parents, without children, and ultimately without the legacy and importance after death. But that's the conclusion I've come to after searching through his website for hours, and I never knew him personally, so I could be way off. Honestly, I would have liked to cover more about this, but there's so much content on his website, the video would just be too long. So I'll put the link in the description for you to have a look at if you're interested, and leave you with a quick fact about the website itself. Martin paid for his website to be hosted for five years in advance, but it was taken down. Anonymous reportedly caught wind of this and got it put back up. I don't know how, and I don't know much about the technical side, but pretty interesting in itself. Thanks for listening, guys.